My father never liked what I read. He favored realistic writers like Conrad and Hemingway, but he had this kid, his oldest son, who read drivel, at least according to him, science fiction, fantasy, stories about wizards, aliens, and starships. Drove him up the wall, especially when I would do things like playing Dungeons and Dragons instead of doing my homework. His argument was that the stuff that I read was escapist. In his mind, it was defense against the real world because I was too lazy or too bored or too frightened to deal with the problems of real life. Uh, it, he was especially angry with me when I failed several classes in junior high school, including ones in math and science. Now, don't get me wrong. I loved and respected him. He was a brilliant man and very successful, but I never agreed with him about this. It's just that I never had an argument about why he was wrong and not just for me. But in my first year of high school, I read a book and I made a friend. The book, the book was Gödel Escher Bach by Douglas Hofstadter. It made me love mathematics. Before I read this book, I got Ds in my math classes. After I read it, I got straight A's. Why? Because it had stories in it. Little stories, little fantasies between each of the chapters featuring Achilles and the tortoise and other characters, which were commentaries on the material in those chapters. I read the stories first, and then only after that did I go back and actually read the chapters themselves. It was brilliant. The friend had just transferred from Washington State to my high school. He also read fantasy and science fiction. He also played Dungeons and Dragons, and he is one of the smartest people I know. He's also a physicist like me, and I think that one of these days he's going to win the Nobel Prize. So I got this idea then that maybe my dad was wrong. Maybe there was something to fantasy and science fiction. This talk is how my 15-year-old self should have spoken to him all the, you know, way back when. Okay, consider Star Trek, the original Star Trek. Um, I was and still am a fan of that series. I've given away my age here. I'm not nearly as familiar with Deep Space Nine or Voyager or especially any of the web series, but I have a deep and abiding love for the 1960s idealistic three-year run of that famous five-year mission. One of the episodes I remember vividly is Let That Be Your Last Battlefield. In this episode, two aliens are in conflict with one another. Um, they are both very similar. They are both, they are both black on one side of their body and white on the other. But the aliens who is white on the left-hand side of his body, Beale, represents a people that had subjugated and enslaved the, other, the, the, the people that the other alien, Lokai, belonged to who were black on the left-hand side of their body. The episode ends with them returning to their home planet and finding that both groups have destroyed each other in a huge battle. Before you say it, yes, it's an obvious metaphor for racial injustice and prejudice. Not even obvious, really, really heavy handed. But fictionalizing prejudice and injustice in this way um, makes them easier to talk about in some sense. There are some issues that are very hard to deal with in the real world, or sometimes even to talk about. By making the story about aliens, we've removed it from reality, one step from reality, it's easier to talk about it because it is alien. Of course, it isn't enough. My dad was right about one thing. Um, you have to face these problems in the real world. Leaving them on screen or in the pages of a book isn't enough, but maybe by actually talking about them in this way, you can actually start, have a start on this and then be able to move the fight back into the real world. I think I'm making the point here that this isn't the escapism that my father thought this literature was. It might look at the world at one remove, the world of aliens, but 
it uses that distance to gaze on real social problems. A lot of science fiction writers have used this, have used this tactic. Ursula Le Guin's novel, The Word for World is Forest, is all about colonialism and prejudice and the problems, in, and the problems involved with environmental destruction. The science fiction writer Isaac Asimov escaped from concerns about the Vietnam War by writing the story Sea Shoot, which was all about a war in space. Back to Star Trek. Its idealism came from its creator, Gene Roddenberry, and his view of the universe, and maybe from the culture of the 1960s as well. Um, it was a world based on a rationalistic view of the universe. The crew of the Enterprise might visit dystopian planets, but the Federation they came from seemed to be pretty close to utopia. Um, it, it, the Federation seemed to be at peace without much internal conflict, without religion. It also se didn't seem to have economy or money in it either. And now science fiction can't predict the future, but it can model it, uh, model it for us. And it does invite us to ask, is this the future that we really want? Babylon 5, a science fiction TV show of the more cynical 1990s, turned the future of Star Trek on its head. This was a future that had conflict in it, had prejudice, had economics and money in it. Um, it asks us instead, are these things inevitable? Are we going to be stuck, you know, whether good or bad, are we going to be stuck with these things until the end of time? It was meant to be more realistic than Star Trek was. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if we are gonna have these things with us till the end of time, but I do think that this cultural modeling is useful because culture changes all the time and we can actually use science fiction and fantasy, you know, these works, Star Trek and Babylon 5 and many, many others to ask what it is that we want from the future and plan accordingly. There's also that aspect of science fiction that has become a cliche, its ability to predict new science and new technology. Um, Leonard Nimoy, the actor who played Spock on Star Trek, was walking down the street one day talking on his flip phone when a bystander pointed him out and yelled out that he was talking on a Star Trek communicator. Science fiction has predicted a lot of new science and technology. Um, space travel, to name just, you know, space travel, among other things, advanced computer systems, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, all things like that. Now, the science is wrong as often as it is right. But of course, if the science were always right, we'd be looking at the Nova, you know, we'd be watching Nova instead of reading fiction. Now, the thing that I think science fiction is best at is something that other literature can't approach at all, the ability to talk about truly cosmic themes in its work. My favorite author of all time is Olaf Stapledon, a British science fiction writer of the 1930s. His work, Star Maker, encompasses the entirety of the universe and all of cosmic time from beginning to end but it centers around a very human question. Does the, does the star maker of its title, the creator of the universe exist? How does it view its creation? How should intelligent beings in the universe view it? The novel presents a majestic sweep of all life over all cosmic time and throughout all corners of the universe and does so using the best science of the time. Olaf Stapleton was well aware of contemporary discoveries in cosmology and astrophysics, and he, were, and, he wove them, and he wove them into this book very successfully. It's also superbly written. At the end of time, the remaining intelligent life in the universe meets and confronts its creator, the star maker. And the meeting is surprising and bittersweet, but I will not spoil it. You should get a copy of the book and read it for yourself. There are other novels with similar cosmic sweeps. Uh, the one I can think of most readily is Arthur C. Clarke's novel, Childhood's End, but they are few and far between. But 
you can only really get that kind of cosmic theme with science fiction. This is why science fiction and fantasy are so important to me. They push us beyond our daily struggles. They don't hide us from them. They give us perspective on them. C.S. Lewis, the well-known author of the Narnia stories, was also a science fiction writer. And he wrote this about science fiction and fantasy. He made this beautiful analogy that the world is like a ship without a rudder, way off course, with the crew all below decks arguing about the best way out of, out of the mess that they're in. Reading, the, reading science fiction and fantasy to him was like escaping to the deck for a few moments to gaze at the stars. So let me go back to my father. He won't see this rebuttal. He died when I was in college. So how can science fiction and fantasy help me in this case? Well, the world's oldest fantasy story, the Gilgamesh epic, is all about death and loss and grief and the attempt to transcend death. Gilgamesh does not achieve this in the story, but the final words are praise of the enduring works that he wrought and perhaps an acceptance over the loss of his friend Enkidu. These are the final things that these works can give us. Catharsis and solace as we move forward to towards an uncertain future in a vast and mysterious cosmos.